Hey, this is Tony Hale. You're watching the whole podcast. Please listen because these are really wonderful people. I think you'll like them. All right. Bye-bye. Welcome to The Hole. I am Rob Sprantz. And I'm Lori Levine. And I'm very excited. Tony Hale is joining us. Tony, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. I've been a fan for a very long time. Uh, thanks no. so much for joining. That's so nice. I love your title sequence. Yeah, that splash fancy, of purple. Right? That's cool. Yeah, like we're, we're trying to do it nice and fancy for you. I paid $100,000 just for this episode for you. Did you <laughs> that sounds like too much. <laughs> I feel like I need to be your friend and say, you paid too much. <laughs> no, I think when we started doing this podcast, one of the Rob's dream guests was you. So it's been like a decade of him <laughs> talking about yeah. you. Right, let's put it this way. We had McConaughey on and I'm more excited about Tony Hale. How about that? Yeah. Take that, McConaughey. No, and I'm a huge fan too, but Rob is on the like FBI's list. Right well, now. let's be honest. I trump McConaughey. Yeah, I mean, let's, course, like, let, let's be honest about that. See, well, before no. we started, I told you, Tony, to make your resolution sharper. I had McConaughey bring his down. So it made me look better. <laughs> <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> well, I uh, first of all, most importantly, congratulations. Uh, today is a big day for you because you've got two different things happening. First of all, the finale of... Uh, the Mysterious Benedict Society uh, hit, hits, which is something that I'm super excited about. I want to definitely talk about that. And yeah, your movie that's out nine days is also getting worldwide release as well. Uh, so it's a big day for you. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so happy to have gigs, man. Very happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. But um, let's start with uh, Benedict because I, I in, in watching it um, – I'm really impressed with just the overall, not only just the production value and just how how wondrous mm. the imagery is of the show in general. Like everything from it being kind of ambiguous to the time and just mm -hmm. the most unique cars and the most unique setup. And then mm. on top of that, we get Tony Hale with a nice full head of hair. Right. <laughs> You're never so, going to see that again. <laughs> so, uh, so how did you wind up getting involved with this to begin with? Well, I was doing um, I was doing a play in San Francisco a year and a half ago. This was right before the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. and I was doing this play. And then they um, brought the, my agent mentioned this uh, series that's happening, and I had honestly never heard. I never read the books. I never heard of them, and so I loved the idea of um, playing two characters. That that first was really exciting for me because I got to play twins. Mm -hmm. So then I started reading the book and then the pandemic hit and the purpose got a little bigger for me because the show talks a lot about um, noise in society and these and I gather these kids around together to kind of find the cause of this noise and to find the truth. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like after this year we've had so much noise, so much noise, and this just everybody's desperate to find the truth. And what's what's a big tool for that is empathy. And this show talks a lot about empathy. So the purpose of doing it and just the whole journey really got bigger for me. I mean, obviously doing two characters was a real challenge, and I was loved it, but it got it got big, much bigger for me. Mm. And you know, yeah, you, you did mention like you know, there's this. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm not going to spoil a lot, but. There's this, oh, there's this overwhelming sense of something called the emergency. There's mm. no specifics. It's just the emergency. And the emergency is what's bringing on an anxiety from everyone. And, mm. and mm. it almost made me like, be like, wow, what, what, what thought process was there even before this that now we're literally in an emergency? Yeah. And, you know, it's, it, um, you know, everything from the misinformation and everything about it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just a really cool, uh, very well done. But even even before the pandemic hit, I think the books really resonated just because I think with social media and everything, just all the different noise we have is creating this anxiety is just all this just this constant of information, this constant stimulus of Instagram and people are. You know, we all know Facebook, Instagram, everybody's putting their best foot forward. <laughs> That's not yeah. the reality behind the scenes. But then we're still listening to it. And so even before that, I felt like it was really relevant. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting is, you know, you work with um, a cast of, uh, of four children who are just mm. fantastic in it and they do such a great job. But, you know, I, I couldn't help but think, you know, two of my favorite characters of yours, either either Buster from Arrested <laughs> and, and Gary from Veep, are very childlike in nature and the innocent side of their mm. characters. And now here you are with children, and now you're playing an adult. An adult. So, <laughs> so it's a, it was like almost like you 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 changed gears on that to, to kind of. Uh, I grew up. <laughs> I guess so. Because Gary and Buster, oh, bless their hearts. Well, I mean, Buster was pretty much, I think he was like maybe a six year old trapped in an adult body. <laughs> maybe that. Right. right. Um, and he was just in a constant state of paralysis. I mean, he could barely get to the pharmacy. Um, <laughs> but like. And Gary was just this, like, emasculated, just, he he just loved Selena, who Julie Louis-Dreyfus played, loved her, but just was abused <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think to kind of step into a very different role where I have a little more, like, I think, honestly, on Veep, I was called a bitchy mime because I wasn't allowed <laughs> to speak. <laughs> yes. oh, yeah. So oh. I could only live in nonverbal. <laughs> um, so I think any job where I'm allowed a voice and Benedict has such a strong voice and curtain, it's, it's really fun. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. Really fun. Yeah. And we'll definitely get into Veep and Arrested in a bit, but, um, what's a, so from the acting perspective, when, what are the differences working with children versus, you know, coming mm. from a couple of shows where you work? And I, I know like you're, you've had, you've done a, a children's book, um, in Archibald's mm -hmm. next big thing that became an animated series, which is very cool on Netflix. I, I recommend you guys check that out. Of course you've played Forky, which we'll get into as well. So it's mm -hmm. not like you, you, you haven't been in that space, but now working with, with children, do you, do you find that it, it actually helps you be in that headspace that you need to be for the show or? Is it with a challenge? Yeah, there? I think I just, yeah, there's, um, I, I will say that these kids are fantastic. There was a big challenge this time because we weren't really, because of uh, the pandemic, we were shooting in the, during COVID and you really couldn't, because you know, typically you kind of go out to dinner with the group and get to know each other and we, we couldn't do that. So we would we would be on set, shoot, and then they would just separate us. And so we really didn't get to know each other. And these kids, man, I have a lot of admiration for them because, you know, it's overwhelming first to sign up for a show like this. Then they had to all leave their families and go to Vancouver for five months. Couldn't come back. They have to have school half the day where all those COVID restrictions Then they have to show up for set. And they all did it with a good attitude. So yeah. I was really inspired by them just for how they handled the whole situation, you know, but yeah. working with kids, it's, I mean, because I did it with Alvin and the Chipmunks, too, where I was um, working with a lot of kids. And it's just, it's like the children's book thing for me. Everything comes down to very simple truths. And I think as adults, we get pretty complicated and we miss those simple truths because there's a lot of power in that. Um, I think we all need to kind of get a little more childlike when it comes to those kind of just basic things that we're all forgetting, honestly. So it's honestly, it's just a reminder of them all the time. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of what uh, Benedict did for me is it, it gives you reminders of those basic core values that mm. really we should all have and sadly doesn't isn't reflected as much as it should be these days yeah. um do you uh i know you have a, a daughter do you watch do you watch this show with your daughter um does she uh, we're, she's pretty embarrassed by everything I do. Like she's pretty <laughs> humiliated. She, I like, I open my mouth and she's like, Oh God, here we go. Wait, she's 15, uh, right? I think she's 15. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a journey. Um, but I, I, of course I absolutely adore her. Um, but like, I, <laughs> what did she say? I think I said this on, I think I was doing Kimmel or something and we were in the car and she's very funny. But she said to me, because I was singing in the car, which that alone is like, you know, what are you doing, Dad? <laughs> and I, she said, she says, Dad, do you think, she goes, do you think you have a good voice? <laughs> and I said, I said, well, I mean, not really. And she goes, well, at least you're aware of it. <laughs> oh wow! I was like, I was like, good timing, good timing. <laughs> um, but she is so sweet, and we, but like Benedict, we do watch together. However, she was much younger when it came to Veep and Arrested, and but then even with Arrested, we could watch that now. But I don't know if you remember that scene where um, uh, my mother Jessica Walter plays Lucille, where she couldn't smoke; she wasn't mm -hmm. allowed to smoke when she yep. was under house arrest, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and. 
she um <laughs> Blow the so smoke she, forced, in your mouth. she forced buster my character to inhale the smoke from her mouth <laughs> and then exhale it on the balcony outside the house like a like a guppy <laughs> right. and i and i think about that and i was like do i really want to sit and watch that with my daughter <laughs> it's like the most dysfunctional right. code of <laughs> or, or when Buster says how he really feels about Lucille. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like, do I want to give yeah. her that opportunity? No, but like it was, but she does, she has seen it, she said, but we don't, we, we do need to watch it together more. But it is, it's fun to her to get to an age where she can kind of see, like Veep, when she was a kid, she had, she was started when we were, she was six maybe. Yeah. And so she had to come to a set and wear um, earmuffs. <laughs> well, or she couldn't, oh no, she, everybody had, uh, everybody who's watching the show had earmuffs to listen to what the dialogue was. And she's the only one who did it, bless her heart. Wow. She was just walking around like, what is, what's everybody listening to? Right. We're like, you're not, you're not listening to that. <laughs> no, that what did they just, what did they just call daddy now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's just daddy carrying a woman's purse. <laughs> know, exactly. Um, but that's, it was, it was unique. Yes, yeah, so actually, that is a uh, something I'm curious about. Do you do you go back and watch you know things that you're in? Um, other than like, a, let's take this, the screenings and previews out. Do you get mm. uncomfortable when you have to watch yourself? Do you do you can you can you jump out of that and actually watch it for what it is, or yeah. it doesn't make you feel a little weird to watch? What if I was like, I love it. <laughs> I <was laughs> I just, like, it's I just on, it's on it loop in my home. It never stops. We don't watch anything else but me. Um, well, v, v is on in every plane I'm in. Like, it'd be know. so funny to see Tony flying and he's watching himself. Which just happened. Which just happened because I was just flying. We went to go see some family. And I had everybody had masks on and I had a hat. So I felt kind of comfortable to watch Veep. And I watched three episodes and I hadn't seen it in years. And it's mm. so, and not only is it fun, but it's just really nostalgic because I mainly really miss the people and just the behind the scenes stuff. I, I love that. So I did watch it on the plane. That's the last time, but I don't really watch it much. I should, yeah. and actually to that point, I was doing, um, I don't, I, I, I watch Arrested so rarely that there are so many things I missed and I've been doing interviews for the show and people would bring up jokes of Arrested that I never got. Oh. <laughs> one one being, I did this podcast, um, this other podcast. Oh, God, is that a, oh, a cricket just joined me on the floor? <laughs> um, but um, it might be a lizard. Um, but uh, I there was a joke about when Buster got his hand eaten off by a seal and the doctor came in and said, oh, he's going to be all right. right. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was. And I made the thing of said, oh, yeah, because I like the joke in itself. And I thought the doctor said he's going to be OK. But then right. somebody in the audience from this podcast goes, no, no, no. He said, all right, because you only have a right arm. I didn't get that joke <laughs> until 15 years later while screening the show. That's crazy. And that happens all the time. Oh, all yeah. the time. Well, you know, one of the th one of the things and the reason why, like I was telling Laura before we started, you are in two of the shows that I feel are top five comedies of all time. And I do put both of those in that category. Mm. Um, and, and both of them are so funny that you do miss jokes because you're laughing at the previous joke. And yeah. Arrested was that level and Veep is that level as well. Um, yeah. It's, you know, the, but the way that Arrested was written and woven was just a, a stroke of genius that because they kept, it was almost like, you know, back in the time of Arrested, I guess mm -hmm. we'll move to Arrested now for a minute. But back in the time of Arrested, things were a little different on television. Um, yeah. It was becoming a reality was taking over. You know, mm -hmm. now streaming has saved scripted television to, to a great extent. Um, yeah. but, in, but back in that time, there was always the brink of cancellation. And I remember instead of ignoring it, it was getting written into the show. And yeah. because there were so many inside jokes, that was the notes that they got. So Mitch put more inside jokes in. Like yeah. it was almost like it's almost yes, like twisting the knife, right? So I mean, what was that like kind of just always wondering if you're coming back or cuz it just seemed like it was so tongue in cheek the way they started really going over the top to do it. Oh yeah, and he really I have to tell you. I'm going to Can I turn <laughs> oh, can I turn my camera around? Oh. Are oh, you going to show different. us the cricket? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to show you the cricket. Do you see the Oh, do you see it? Oh, it's just right there. Do you see yeah. it? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it it's was a, it was kind of cicada, and it's yeah, funny. I I, it, it was starting to walk towards me when you were talking. I was like, <laughs> "Man, you're what's going on?" I didn't know if he was going to jump on me. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
clean house, guys. Clean hey, house. hey <laughs> if house. it jumps on you, um, you can decide whether or not we leave it in, but based on your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can leave it. Um, so, honestly, it was, it was very – I remember at the time – this is my first gig. This is my first big, I'd done commercials many years in New York and that was kind of my first big gig. And so I was just so happy to have a gig, but we never knew if we were coming back every year. We were like, we don't know. And so he just kept taking all these risks and almost kind of, you know, making fun of things, the production, all this kind of stuff, but it felt exciting. And then at the same time, it was like, Oh, <laughs> Right, <laughs> we, yeah. you know but to your point the show is so dense it's very dense and back then you didn't ha we didn't even ha we didn't have dvrs where you could uh rewind all that kind of stuff so if you missed it you missed it yeah. and that's why the show gained traction when it went to uh dvds because people could buy the dvds and they could really start seeing how layered the show was and that's i think where it started to kind of get some popularity because I mean, to the, I mean, my favorite joke, one of my favorite jokes in the whole show was the blue man group, Tobias and the blue man group. <laughs> right. And I, I thought it was so funny on set. I thought it was so funny when I saw the show, but there were so many layers I missed mm -hmm. so many layers that I didn't catch until later. And it really took, and now when it's on Netflix, people can really start to dive in, but we didn't have that back then. Yeah, and you know, there's everything from there's literally like random scenes. There's a blue handprint on the wall yeah. with no explanation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So how did and, how did you wind up getting that? Uh, getting the role itself? Like, how, did you who, did you channel anybody for Buster? It's <laughs> such a unique character. This is what scares me. The role kind of came naturally to me. <laughs> so I think I think clearly that comes from a lot of pain. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, I. I, I will say I did when I was in New York, I was doing commercials and I did this comedy sketch group called King baby. Mm -hmm. And I remember playing this character named singing Billy and he would just walk into these spaces and start singing. And he was really kind of awkward. And I think Buster had a little bit of singing Billy in him, but he was, I remember talking to Mitch Hurwitz and I gave him, I asked him a very actor question, very actor question. I said, what do you think Buster wants in life? And he gave me the answer. He says, I think all, all that Buster wants in life is safety. Mm -hmm. And that began to color everything. Because if you look at the way Buster even stood, his chin was back. He would always have his hands back here. He was always in like a right. state of defense. He was always kind of like, what's, what's coming at me? What's coming at me? <laughs> and he, that's all he wanted was safety. So anything that threatened that safety, he would kind of go into this defense mode. Mm -hmm. Um, and that really just kind of colored him. And so when I was in New York, well, I was doing commercials. And so I, I got, I got the role, which was crazy. And I remember I was, I had just gotten engaged to my wife and then 10 days before we got married, the show got picked up and then we moved out to LA. And honestly, looking back, I was just kind of in this, like, all right, let's do this. But, and I was very overwhelmed. I was very anxious. I had never been on a studio lot. I had never had that much free food offered to me. <laughs> I was just like, I was an actor. I was like, you when you have any kind of free food, you you take it home. You take so it. I was I was like taking all the food you brought home the at night. Wear. Oh yeah, just like I'm taking all the chicken, all of it. <laughs> and but I was so overwhelmed. So I really kind of felt like it was a good space to be in for Buster because Buster was very overwhelmed and very anxious. And so it kind of was this perfect storm of where I was in life. And just the character itself. Yeah, that's a, that's a very cool uh, that you get to use that part. You know, this yeah. was and that was your first your first gig. And I I remember you saying once I don't know if it was something I read, but you had said that you thought that once you landed a show, mm. like you would you would be so happy yeah. and you'd finally get your goal. But it almost did the opposite for you. It did, and I do love to talk about this because when I was in New York, I I was there seven years, and my dream in life was have a sitcom. I grew up on the Carol Burnett show. I just, Tim Conway, the Bob Newhart. I loved sitcom. And I, and I remember my whole time in New York, even though I loved my time in New York, I was like, this is okay, but that big thing is coming. Mm -hmm. And then when I got that big thing, it didn't satisfy me the way I thought it was going to satisfy me. It really scared me. And it's because I had not been present for most of my life. 
I had never really practiced, and I do think it's a discipline. I don't think it, I don't think it's an overnight thing, but I had never even practiced like looking around me, whether it be hard or easy, like really trying to be present. And that whole thing is if you're not practicing contentment where you are, you're not going to be content when you get what you want. And I had not really practiced just the discipline of being where I was all those years before. Therefore, when I got my big thing, and also all those years before, I was like, what's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? Then I got my big thing, my next, and I was still looking to the next thing. I was still because I had, that's, that's what I was used to. And so it really woke me up to a, a lot of therapy bills <laughs> <laughs> and just to kind of, and like he would give me exercises of when you're in a space, like, what are you seeing? What are you smelling? What are you hearing? What are you tasting? What are you holding? Like ground yourself in the space. Um, you know, right now, where are you right now? I'm talking to wonderful people on the whole podcast. That's where I am right now. You know, always having to, and I still do it. I have to remind myself where I am because if I don't, then whatever unfolds, I'm going to have given it too much weight. Because by the way, my default is to be checked out. My default oh, wow. is to be checked in my anxiety, to be somewhere else. That's easy for me. What's mm -hmm. difficult is to be right here. That's right. the challenge. And so that's what I've been trying to work on. Yeah. And I mean, I guess over time too, because it's, you know, it's easy to look back and say, you know what, I'm, I'm building a body of work. There's no one specific thing mm. that's going to, that's going to make or break it. When you, when you look back, you know, now you've, you know, I've got, these are all things you're involved in, you know, but I guess yeah. at the, at the time when there's just one thing, especially a show that teeters on cancellation from, yeah. from week to week, I can see how that can, you know, you don't get a chance to enjoy it. And more importantly, yeah. probably makes it harder to look back on it and remember moments that because you're just not absorbing them. Right. I'm not absorbing it. And it's and again, this is a lifelong. I mean, I'm I think I talk about this so much because it's really hard for me. It's really hard for me. And I have to remind myself. But, you know, you always hear it is about the journey and not the destination. And it is something that I have to wake myself up to all the time. There's no, there's no ultimate destination that is coming. It's almost like the older I get, I'm 50. And the older I get, the more that I can find the extraordinary in the ordinary, I think I've won. Because it really is the ordinary parts of the journey that has the magic. But our society makes it, it's the big stuff. Where's the magic? I just don't, I don't think that's true. I really yeah. don't such a great way to, to see things you know and and I, I guess we could we could kind of say that about even our show like you know we have a great guest we have a great episode and then as soon mm -hmm. as it's done who's next like i don't you know it's you're absolutely right it's something that uh but it's hard it's, it's hard, hard. hard to do yeah um it's also just to add to this it's also we're in a business where people ask us what's next you know it's right. like you guys are asked what's next what's coming up for you all that kind of stuff you kind of don't ask a dentist what's next. <laughs> you know, you don't go up to a lawyer and say, what's next for you? I mean, they might, but it's like, we are freelancers. We are constant. So it's almost like we're encouraged to think what's next, which makes right. it even more of a challenge to try to be where we are because it's not encouraged. Like we are, we are actually taught to be looking ahead. Yeah. That's such a great point. That's such a great um, perspective to take. And, it kind of seems like you're doing that a little better now, for sure, you know. Um, Hoping, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we get, I do want to, of course, talk about Veep, but before we get there, I do want to jump to Nine Days because um, hmm. this it is a film. It looks amazing. It, it really oh, does. it's so beautiful. Yeah, the trailer looks beautiful. Um, it's kind of one of those things where I don't fully um, get the concept, and that's kind of the point. Mm. You need to go mm. in and experience it. Tell us a little bit, if you can, about just just what that perspective is, because it seems really, really unique. It's really unique. And it's, um, I mean, speaking of kind of moments, whereas kind of like Benedict talked about finding the truth above the noise, Nine Days is, it's, it's a group of candidates who are trying to live. And Winston Duke plays his character, Will, who is choosing whether these souls live or not. And I'm one of the candidates. And you see these people peering into all these people's lives on earth and kind of trying to figure it out. And they desperately want those moments. And it really is like a wake up call of, especially after the pandemic where we all appreciate it, it's like waking up to like, 
appreciating the moments that I'm taking for granted. I mean, now when I go to a party, you know, or when I'm I'm around somebody, I get to hug somebody. It's like, (gasps) oh my gosh, this is something I took for granted, you know, a year ago. And so it's, it talks, but here's the thing. This is a very common theme, like the kind of living for the day and moments, but the way Ed Sonoda did it, the director, it is such a unique creative way that he kind of brought this to life. And so I'm, I'm really excited for people to see it. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's just so great. You have two things hitting at once and it, it almost seems like one of those movies that you just need to see rather than I, like, yeah. I almost, I almost don't want to know more about it because I'm going yeah. to see it, you know? Um, so that actually today also you can see it in, in theaters in, in is it's just theaters only right now. Right. Yeah. Good. Cause that's how I want to see it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way to do it. Um, so yeah, you can, uh, you can go check out, get some tickets. Uh, it's available now. Check out nine days as well. Um, so moving on to Veep now, um, again, I've mentioned, again, another top five show. I, were you familiar with Armando Inucci's work before this? Because I was a big fan of Thick of It. Mm. And I have to admit, mm. when, I, when I heard it was coming, a version was coming to America, I was concerned. Because sometimes mm. America can take uh, a British show and Americanize it too much. Mm-hmm. It took about 30 minutes for me to completely change my, my mind on that. Um, so were you familiar with his work before this? or I was not, and I love that you were. I was, I was not. I, I wasn't familiar until, until I, kind of the opportunity came my way, and then I dove into the thick of it. Um, but just <laughs> – let me just say first off, the, the creativity of insults that Armando Yannucci <laughs> and his team can create is <laughs> – unreal yeah. like i it is unreal mm. and so watching the thick of it and just watching the language but not even like to me it wasn't even a, it, it was just how um the vault of how you can insult people is just like <laughs> holy cow like it was so funny and that kind of paralleled with julia louis dreyfus you know playing the vice president and which is always which is you know can be seen as in the shadow of the president. And then you take someone who's just a complete narcissist like Selena Meyer and how that just drives her crazy. And then me kind of like a lap dog, like the equation was just sounded really fun, really, really fun. So it was, I would, you, and it honestly, the big thing that was exciting was working with someone like Armando, you felt safe. Like you felt like the story was going to be told because you had seen, I'd seen the thick of it. And I was like, wow, if this story can be told like that mm-hmm. and HBO gives that freedom, which they did. Yeah. You're like, Oh, you just feel like now I'm excited to be on this ship, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, you mentioned the insults. Uh, we actually had Matt Walsh on a while back. Who was oh. just such a <laughs> great guy. Great guest. Super great talented guy. with improv mm-hmm. too. And I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked him, which was, you know, the first year those scripts were written already. The insults are already there. But come year two, they're written for you. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. Not to mention insults that were like randomly brought up by cast members in the middle of the scene. (laughs) And I'm like, what? I remember Reed, Reed Scott, who played Dan, Randomly mm. just called Gary, my character, cow eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I and I was that. like, I'm sorry. A, that's not in the script. <laughs> we had a whole improv situation, and that, that didn't come up. <laughs> so, it was, and I'll tell you who got it the worst, though, obviously, is Jonah, who yeah. Timothy Simon played. My favorite, and this is kind of a, a, it's an awful thing to say, but it makes me laugh so hard, is when he was called, Frankenstein's monster. If Frankenstein's monster was made entirely of dead dicks, <laughs> <laughs> and it's so awful, so atrocious, <laughs> and actually, um, that was that was that was brought up by. Um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. He was on Silicon Valley. Wonderful man. He played um, Amy's boyfriend. Yes, yes, yes. I know. I know. I don't know his name. I know exactly who you I mean. I just blanked on his name, and he's such a good guy. Anyways. He he came up with that on the spot, and I'm sure I'm sure Tim is like, really, man. 
Really? So, yeah, like he was everything from an oversized barbecue fork to a like it's just it just kept going. <laughs> I didn't I didn't remember that one. Yeah. I remember Plato like Plato on a pole. <laughs> or, 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 or at one point he had the worst where it says you just have no shape. Like I think he was just said like he has no shape, and it's like, oh man, that's hard. <laughs> so you mentioned the improv. So you guys did have some time to improv that. Um, yeah. Before, before you went, that's great. So they would do yeah, they, the script. It, yeah. Initially, they had Armando. We had like two weeks before we shot the pilot. Just and it really wasn't necessarily to, I would say, come up with bits. It was more which I appreciated because I think when you have that pressure of like come up with stuff, it's like, uh, it can kind of suck the creativity out of the space because you feel like you're in performance mode a little bit. Mm. So, but he really wanted to see if things gelled. Like, let's see if this action gels. And then when you kind of have that freedom of like, okay, we're not like just trying to write bits, then stuff would naturally come up, you know, mm. a lot. Now, you, you've you got gotten six Emmy nominations for the show. Uh, you've won two, which, you know, deservedly so. Um, how did that feel? Somebody who, you know, wanted to be an actor all his life and it was that moments that you were able to enjoy mm. or does it bring oh, yeah. on a whole new level of anxiety? I love, <laughs> no, I love that you, Zach, Zach was the guy's name. Um, oh, by Zach, the way, right. but, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm like, it was going crazy in my mind. Um, I honestly, that was, you know, that happened post a lot of therapy. If I'm, if I'm honest, after arrested that whole kind of stuff I went through and I remember my therapist saying, hey, because I was nervous. I, I'd never been in that kind of environment. I'd never been invited to that party. You know, the Emmys, that felt overwhelming. And my what I kind of wanted to do was kind of check out. Like, I wanted to kind of minimize it and be like, it's okay. Like, I had a lot of it. And he was like, no, I really want to challenge you to take it in. Mm -hmm. Like, really go. And because I think in my anxiety, I was like, I'm going to freak out. I'm going to be sitting there and just right. freak out. Yeah. And He's like, no, I want you to take it in. I want you to look around, take some deep breaths and look around. And because I did that, I remember it. Oh, I remember it. And that, it was a big lesson for me. Yeah. Big lesson. Yeah. Yeah, when they Wait, Tony, what's the background of when you went on the stage when Julia won the Emmy? Yes. Did you oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. That was, <laughs> that morning, um, uh, Julia called me and said, hey, I'm thinking – if I win, and in my head I'm thinking you are, mm. if I win, I want you to carry my purse. <laughs> and I was like, okay, first of all, again, you are. So that means on national television, I'm just going to go up on stage with you and carry your purse to a, a, a throng of people who probably haven't even seen the show. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and like thinking, what the hell is this guy doing behind her held in the purse? But it was that kind of thing like, hey, Let's do it. And I, I'll never forget when she, they called her name and I was sitting behind her and I saw her and she turned to me and I was like, this is it. I can't <laughs> leave her hanging. I can't leave her hanging. And I rushed up and then we just kind of, and we had planned a little things, but not many. And then by the grace of God, it, I think it worked. Yeah. No, you get, <laughs> yeah. You gave her a little bit of the whisper in the ear as well for every, <laughs> <laughs> to, rem so to remember good. to thank her family. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so so on that show, you know, working with Julia too, like so in in Arrested, you've got I think Arrested either made a lot of the um actors even more famous than they were. Um whereas, you know, Jason it was another level for him for sure. Will was really the first time everybody's exposed mm. to Will. Um and a lot of them hit another level because of that show. Now with mm. Veep you're walking into a lineup. Mm. I mean, Julia, Jesus, mm. you know, just Seinfeld alone, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're already walking into a lineup of people who are just, you know, seasoned pros. Do, mm. you, do you, um, you know, sometimes I always get this, uh, you know, this like imposter syndrome where like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing oh, it yeah. or, or maybe I shouldn't be, you know, somebody's going to tap me on the shoulder and tell me I should be yeah. doing this or whatever it is. You get yeah. that feeling as well? Every, every job. Every job I get that feeling. And my wife told me something that I really appreciated when she was a makeup, she, my wife was a makeup artist on SNL for seven years. And she said every, without, she seemed, it seemed like every single guest member or anything 
that came in always felt like someone's made a mistake and they're going to find out I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> and it's across the board. And I love that you said that because we just don't talk about it. Every job, when I walked into Benedict, I'm like, they're going to wake yeah. up <laughs> thinking <laughs> they got the wrong guy for the job. Yeah. Um, and also even with Veep, big time with Veep, because Matt Walsh, who create was one of the founders of Upright Citizens Brigade, you know, created pretty much a whole improv journey. I'm not an improv actor. I'm a, I, I came from sketch. I like I, a, a script. I, I do not have much improv experience. I was just walking in going, oh, my God. Like, I don't know if I can hold up to these guys. I remember the after mm -hmm. the first rehearsal of Veep, we were in London. They brought us to London, which was very kind to rehearse. And I remember the first night calling my wife and being like, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to oh, get wow. fired. They're going to take me out. Just because <laughs> I didn't have that 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 tr I did after working on that show, I really it kind of refined my tool of um, improv, but I didn't really have it a at first. And I just remember thinking, I'm not coming up with anything. They're going to get rid of me. And then cut to, they didn't really want us. They were kind of wanting to see if it gelled, but I didn't know. Yeah. And Matt was just coming up with bits because he had that tool refined. Yeah, and you. But you know, a lot of Gary's and you know the improvs that you've done aren't even verbal. No, a lot of them, I think even with Buster, like the, yeah. the way he holds himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. To the point where on, I, I so was nonverbal on beep and Selena. So did not want me to speak. I was called a bitchy mime. That was my, <laughs> that was the name I was called. Cause I just stood behind her and just did nonverbal insane expressions. But it, it worked. And, and that, that's what pulled it off. But what I can't <laughs> fathom is how you can, watch these takes and be part of them and not laugh a mm -hmm. little, especially when some of them are made up. Like, I don't know if I could ever and, well, and you yeah. can see sometimes like there's a little creep, you know, you can kind of oh, see yeah. sometimes people. Anytime I'm looking at my bag on beep, I'm laughing. Anytime <laughs> I'm, if you ever see me kind of go <laughs> to my bag and reach up, I'm fully disguising a laugh. I, I was known to be the guy who, um, who would just break. However, I was put that stamp, but I would, I would argue because I've seen every gag reel. I think Julia broke more than I did just to put mm. that out there. Okay. <laughs> but I, I, my thing is I rem I'll never forget. And I've said this before, but it's true. Um, I remember I couldn't not laugh during this take once. And she turned to me and she says, Tony, you know, you're not watching the show. You're in the show. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, and it's like when you're that close to Julia Louis-Dreyfus and you can hear the little subtle noises she makes mm. or the little like things, the little side things. It's like, sorry, it's impossible. I can't keep it together. Right. I ruin takes or I just turn my back. Yeah. I would I would just fully just turn my back and look in my bag <laughs> and Julia would just be like, well, there he goes again. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, it, you know, again, I, I, I got to congratulate you on that one, too. Um, just a, another fantastic show. And I, I don't want to. I know right. time is time is limited, but I can't not talk about your um, getting the Forky role in mm. Toy Story, which again is another one. It's um, there was a, Toy Story Four, so it's already you know a, such an iconic kind of franchise, mm. and, and it kind of you know Benedict has reminds me of that in a little ways because. Pixar writes things for adults and children simultaneously. Mm. Um, they're just, it's one of their incredible skills. And the entire animation industry has shifted to mm. that model. But at the time, mm. like you, you could watch it and not even realize you're watching a cartoon. Um, so like, are you over the moon when you find out you get that role? I, w I was over them. I was also just, I'm always, I'm always like, really? <laughs> like that is it's always shocking to me I, I i don't even i i really they called and and, and they said you know pixar is interested in you um for this role in the new toy story and i just remember this moment of like i talk about imposture like i was like ah this what are you talking and also i remember going up to um Pixar headquarters, which is like a creative wonderland. Spork, the, the Spork never came into my mind. I was like, Spork? Wait, what? What's going on? And I just, honestly, that's where, those are one of those moments where I had that, that thing of like, what's happening? And then you just keep walking. Like, I'm just going to mm -hmm. keep walking. I'm going to meet them. And the whole time thinking, hey, if it doesn't work out, 
people have been replaced. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fine. <laughs> but just like taking it day to day, we would try these different voices. They showed me diagram. Like they had added when I first got to Pixar, they had had they had an animated uh, Forky, and they had put Buster's voice and Gary's voice in <laughs> the Forky because they because they wanted that kind of an angle. And so we played a little bit with that, and then the kind of voice, the other, the real voice came out of that. But I, I mean, to be honest, it was just this. I genuinely, and this is the honest truth, I think it was maybe a two months before the movie came out, where that's maybe when I felt assured that because I saw the trailer and I was like, okay, they didn't replace me. <laughs> they, they, wow. they kept my voice because that happens a lot. Like if the voices, I've done animation on my show and it's like if a, if a voice isn't working on a, on a character you you know you have to kind of, it's an awful thing to do but you've got to just kind of find a different voice right. and so and sometimes that happens without you even knowing it there was a cartoon i did for netflix and i remember seeing it and, and hearing and i voiced that character and they put a different voice in and didn't tell me oh, wow. did, you, like, did you already brag that you got that <laughs> no <laughs> that I, was, thankfully i didn't tell any i didn't tell anybody because i've done that before i remember <laughs> years ago i was i did a bit on conan when i was living in new york and i told my whole family to wait up to 11 o'clock at night because that's before dvrs they all waited up cut me they cut my segment <laughs> and i was like nope, <laughs> not doing that again but i saw the cartoon and my voice wasn't in that they just they'll just replace you so it really wasn't until i saw the trailer where i was like all right they kept me. They kept me. Yeah, and the character itself took off too. Like because you, anywhere you go, like here, this is even this is this is my nephew Aiden with Aww. a forky uh, with a forky Aiden headset. Aiden is his name. Uh, Aiden, yeah, he is a forky. Oh, headset I'm gonna on. do. I'm gonna do. Uh, after we get off, I'm gonna do a voice memo to Aiden oh from Forky oh, saying hi. Dude. So I'll send it to I guess Rob or, or Sammy, and we'll um, they'll send it to you. So just saying that's hi so from nice. Forky. Ah, uh, that's so nice of you. Thank you so much. That's great. His name is Aiden. Uh, A I D. A A A I D E N Aiden, yeah. Aiden. Okay, cool, great. Uh, that's so that's so sweet. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's um, do you when you so when you have that when you're doing that, do you, are you with the other actors doing the scene, or is one by one by one you're doing it? It's one by one. It would be great if we could, but obviously people's schedules it was really tough. So the director Josh Cooley, who's just a fantastic guy, he would always just read off of me doing uh, Forky and then you just kind of got into the energy that way. Sometimes we would hear someone else's recordings, but not typically. And then I would just go on a rant of like trash, like I'm trash. And he would just get different <laughs> versions of me saying I'm trash. And, and it's interesting because the more I was there, the more I really, to your point of just the profound themes that are going on where here's a fork, a spork that came into the world thinking, Hey, I'm here to help people eat chili and go to the trash. That's my, that's my lifeline. Yeah. And what he's like, no, you are, you have value. You are more than that. And you're made to be, to be, to love and to be loved. And mm -hmm. it's like, holy God, who yeah. doesn't want to hear that? You know, <laughs> I know it's great. They, they, uh, they are just another level. And I'm, I'm so glad you got to be part of that. Me too. Um, and, and, and again, I, I can't thank you enough for, for your time. Um, oh, it's so great. fun. Same here. We really enjoyed it. And uh, I want everyone, again, two things. First of all, uh, Mysterious Benedict Society, Disney Plus. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. almost nothing to subscribe. Subscribe. Check out the episodes. It really is so very well done. And Tony's mm -hmm. great in it. He mentioned he's Thanks. got a dual, dual role. I didn't want to give it away. But he's playing two adults for a change, which is great. <laughs> <It's just crazy. laughs> yeah. Not man children. Adults. Right. Ex exactly. And um, and Nine Days as well is as as, mm -hmm. uh, out in theaters. So check that out. Uh, Tony, hang on one second. I'll wrap it up. I'll Wait, be right any back. update oh. with the cricket before we go? Oh, yeah. Well, that's, oh, that's a good, good point. Gosh. I don't see him. So maybe he's in the couch uh -oh. <laughs> so we'll see he'll pop up somewhere because the doors are closed right. I, I hope i don't see this on the news in a couple of days i know Tony I it's like in my ear Tony dies during podcasts and cricket jumps in the air <laughs> thank you for listening to the whole i am rob's friends and i'm laura levine later